I think it was, it was, might have been yesterday or the day before, anywhere on the news about a British journalist who was giving an interview to the BBC and her thoughts on what to do if you have a suffering child. Yeah, and she was completely serious about how the compassionate thing to do would be. She's talking about how she could see that any mother who really loved her, her child, if she could see that the child was, you know, really suffering, would just take a pillow and suffocate it. And the interviewer said, like, well, that's really a, I can't remember her exact term. <laughs> Uh, daring is too nice, but that was really sort of a maybe a terrible or Twisted. yeah something like that thing to say. And and the, the the kicker was that the woman was like, "What really?" Like she had no idea that what she just said would, would be taken in any way as offensive. You know, like I don't know what planet she's been on, but if you really think about it. You know, you, you really can spend a lot of time in certain contexts where that is acceptable. Now, I used to begin this lecture, because they aren't very hard to find, with an anecdote like that. Or I would ask my audience, I typically do this in Christian colleges, how many of you here are pro-life? And, you know, turnover. Yeah. You know, I would ask, how many of you are pro-life? And invariably, most, if not all, of the hands would go up. And I would ask, why? Why are you pro-life? Why do we hear the story about the lady on the BBC and just feel like, ugh? You know, I mean, why, why is that visceral? Why is that offensive? Typically, you know, someone is going to come up with the image of God, that human life is sacred. Because you always get the illustration, well, if it was your dog, okay, no matter how much you loved your dog, if you knew your dog was suffering or some other, you know, animal like a racehorse or something, you would have no trouble saying that the compassionate thing to do, the right thing to do, would be to end that animal's life, end the dog's life, put the racehorse down. And everybody would you know, pretty much agree with that. So it begs the question, well, why is that any different than this? And again, we go back mentally to this sanctity of human life thing. So I would go into that, and then I would pull the, the rug out from under them, because freshmen deserve that. <laughs> And I would say, chances are, if we talked about the image of God, your position on this re really doesn't give you any defense. And I would go into why. And I'm going to actually jump into that tonight because I do believe, and I'm very pro-life, but I do believe that the way that a lot of Christians articulate their understanding of what the image of God is, that it actually undermines a sanctity of life ethic. And they don't know it, but it does. So as we take our last little foray here into Genesis, we're going to hit this passage, which I telegraphed to you last week, Genesis 126. And I want to talk about this because I think this is a really important topic. And since I only had four weeks, I kind of picked you know, a couple of hobby horses, and this is one of them, because I really, I do think we could do so much of a better job articulating this than we do. Now, we're all familiar with this passage. God said, let us make man or mankind in our image, in our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, so on and so forth. So God created man or humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Everybody knows this passage. And if we have questions about the plurals, we can hit that when we're done. 
The other, it's actually a rare phrase. The other place you get it is Genesis 5.1. There's two other passages. This is one of them. This is the written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Similar phrasing. Verse 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness. Again, the likeness phrase, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Now, most commentators, and I would agree, would say that the language here is specifically designed to hearken back to Genesis 1.26 and let us know that whatever this imaging thing is about, it was transmitted. It keeps going after the fall. Okay, that the language here is deliberate so that whatever, there was, whatever it was about Adam that made him special, Adam's offspring shared that and passed it on. Okay. Here's the other passage where you get the phrase. This is after the flood, and God tells Noah, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God has God made man. This is the basis, pre-Mosaic law, for capital punishment in the Old Testament, Old Testament theology. And the rationale here is, when you kill a human being, and by the way, I should say, because God is going to kill lots of human beings later, and he's going to have a system of law that allows for the death penalty, so we need to make some qualifications here. Whenever you take an innocent life, a life that is not deserving of death, that has done nothing to forfeit life, okay, whenever you take a life like that, it is though you... In some sense, it's as though you killed God in effigy, okay? God was offended that you would take the life of an innocent human being for no lawful reason because there's something about that human being that is connected. There's a connectedness between that human being and God. And so, again, that becomes the rationale for if you do that, then you're going to forfeit your own life as well. Now, some preliminary observations just from these texts. You'll notice, if you rehearse them in your mind, Genesis 1.26, Genesis 5.1, Genesis 9.6, both men and women are included in what we will call for now image-bearing, okay, male and female, Genesis 1 said. The image is that which makes mankind distinct from the rest of the Genesis creation, in other words, plants and animals. The text does not teach us, however, that the image makes us distinct from angelic beings because it's very possible, and that is my view, that the us in Genesis 1.26 refers to the heavenly host, God speaking to his heavenly host. You might have heard that it refers to the Trinity. There are some serious problems with that. Again, if we want to do that in Q&A, we can. So whatever it is, it's shared with whoever the us is. There's something about the image that makes mankind like God in some way. Since God is a person, those who image him share in his personhood. In other words, if you're going to say that there's something about this image thing, image bearing, that we share with God, there's something communicable between God and humanity. And we're distinct from the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. Since God is a person, it's quite reasonable to assume that part of that distinction is this thing we call personhood. Okay? There's a connection there. There's nothing in the text to suggest that the image has been or can be bestowed incrementally or partially. In other words, you don't get it in stages. It seems to be described as something humanity either possesses, you know, passes on to each human being, or not. In other words, you don't get part of it one day and then three months later you get another installment. Okay, there's, no, there, there's nothing that tells you that it's incremental. Therefore, you can't speak of being partly or potentially an image bearer. And that's going to become important. And the bearing of children in some way mimics or relates to the initial creation of humankind as 
an image bearer. So what do we need to say? If we're going to articulate, if we're going to answer the question, what is and isn't the image of God, there are some things we need to say. However we define it, it has to make humankind distinguishably and certifiably unique in relation to any created thing that makes the physical universe its home. You've got to say at least that much. Every member of the human race must possess this image equally and to the same extent. And the image must be something shared with God's own being and nature. So if you're going to come up with some criteria, those are the ones I propose. And I want to start with what the image of God is not. I'm going to go through some common proposals. And now that you have fixed in your mind these three, okay, it's got to be unique. have to have it equally to the same extent. There's no incrementalism. And it has to be shared with God. Those three ideas, let's see if any of these proposals meet those criteria. I would suggest the image of God is not any of these things. And chances are, if you look up image of God in a theology book, you're going to find something on this list uh, that I say, nope, it's not going to work. Intelligence, rationality, emotions, ability to know God or commune with him, the soul, possession of a soul idea, again, whatever that is, free will, conscience, sense of morality, and the ability to communicate. You can find all of those in systematic theology books. You say, well, what don't you like about them? They can't be said to be present equally among all human beings. They can't be said to be, pre- to be present actually among all human beings. You can't leave anybody out. Because as soon as you leave one human being out, then that human being is divorced from personhood. And again, this thing we call the sanctity of life. In some instances, they are not distinguishably and certifiably unique to humans. But all of them fail the first two criteria. You can fail the third, too. Let's talk about equal to humans, unique to humans. Some of these faculties, again, intelligence, emotion, all that sort of stuff, are not uniformly distributed and are possessed only potentially by some human beings. Examples, the fetus. Can the fetus pray? Can the fetus think? Can the fetus communicate? And all these things are subject to definition and they will fail somewhere along the line because the fetus doesn't have a brain. The problem with a lot of these is they're linked to to the brain. That means before you have a brain, and there is a time when all of us didn't have a brain, (laughs) before you have a brain, you're out of luck. Okay, if, if that's what the image is, then by definition, you don't have it. You say, oh, well, the little you know, little cellular, little ball of whatever it is. It, it, I mean, everything's in there to make a brain, so it potentially has a brain. You're right. So we have a potential person. Why are you opposed to abortion? If it's not really a person, either there's potential and actual. If it's not actually a person, what's the problem? Again, you, you get into some real dicey areas if you want to link the image to brain function, and even, even if you have a brain function. What about if brain function is destroyed? What about severely, severe retardation? Okay, vegetative state, that sort of thing. If you're going to link it to that organ, and by the way, you're saying that the image, therefore, is obtained chronologically okay, as you grow, that which means there's a time before that, that point that you don't have it, and then afterwards you do. Okay, again, that's ethically pretty tenuous. If you're going to say these things, then you weaken an ethical position that has the sanctity of life as its basis. You're going to be trapped pretty quickly. Free will, conscience, sense of morality, the ability to communicate. None can be said to be held in actuality to humanity. 
in reference again to infants in some cases, the fetus, fertilized human eggs, zygotes, severely retarded. This also presumes that no animal, not even one, as soon as you find one member of the animal kingdom, one non-homo sapiens, okay, as soon as you find one member of the human, uh, the, of the animal kingdom, that can act contrary to instinct, even once, then you have a problem. Do animals ever act contrary to instinct? Do they ever portray by their actions some sort of oughtness or, again, just something that's contrary to nature? One of, the, one of the fields, if you're interested in this topic, just a little rabbit trail here, one of the fields I think you'd find fascinating is a field called animal cognition. Uh, you would be startled uh, to know and see test results that are given equally, same test, to a chicken and a toddler. Sometimes the chicken really destroys the toddler. <laughs> On an intelligence test, okay? I mean, so, and animals do do things that are contrary to nature, you know, that because, again, we all, we, we've all read this stuff, you know, that they, an animal would react in some way in the ben to the benefit of its owner, to the detriment of itself, you know, jumping through a burning window or something like that. That's, that isn't something the animal is born with. There's part of the brain that, oh, okay, now I know how to jump through burning windows, okay? I mean, that, that's just something that develops. It's a developmental issue. So you, know, you get into these areas of, that seem to overlap and tread on things that we want to be distinctly human if we want to define the image in a certain way. Communication. What about animal communication? Communication doesn't have to be verbal, does it? Certainly not. There are more than one type. There is more than one type of communication. There are a good number of examples where higher order animals can and have communicated with humans. It's, it's the old teaching Coco the gorilla sign language. And it's not just memory work, even though that would be learning, which requires intelligence, but it's something that goes beyond just learning facts. If you've never read any, anything about training chimps or anything to use sign language, there are a number of them that have taken what they're taught and they form independent sentences with them. As soon as they do that once, that's intelligence. Okay, that's an independent mind creation of you know, this information I'm given because I'm using it for a new purpose, to tell my owner to clean my cage now. Okay? <laughs> I mean, there are just things like this. It, 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 it's a fascinating field. We also sort of assume that communication has to occur across species for it to be real. Like your dog would have to talk to you to be really intelligent. Uh, you can't talk to your dog either. Um, why not within a species? Why doesn't that count? I mean, who made up that rule? A little, more, little bit more on intelligence. What if some of these other you know, issues if the image is intelligence, is there an intelligence threshold? Do smarter people have more of the image? What about emotional intelligence? If we're going to define it that way, if you have a higher EQ instead of an IQ, you know, is, is that connected to the image in some way? And again, you can't measure these things at all when it comes to the little cellular dot that's growing inside of a woman that we want to call a person. Okay, a full human being, not a partial human being or a potential human being. Because if you're going to go there, then again, back to my questions, why do these ethical, these dastardly ethical statements, why would they offend you? Artificial intelligence. It's subject to definition, but do we really want the image of God in human personhood subject to definition? Because definitions can change. Okay, that's a little... It would be easy for people in that field to do a little sleight of hand or sophistry and sort of run rings around the theologian who wants to link imaging to just intelligence. ET life, what if that was a reality at some point? And a lot of people are, you get into religious discussion about this topic, 
especially the Catholic Church, who spent a lot of time on this. One of their big fears or one of their big things they think they need to confront or deal with or have an answer for is if you have an intelligent extraterrestrial, then that must mean that they share the image and are in need of redemption. That's a lot of theological extrapolation, which to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But if you're going to define the image in, in a shareable way with a non-human life form, that's the real issue. Then you've got a problem. Because then you're no longer unique. Soul. In part, the question depends on the origin of the soul, which we're never told about in Scripture. Where does a soul come from? Your options are biology. Let's just do a little, little theology, little systematic theology rabbit trail here. You have three options in systematic theology. One is called traditionism, which says that the man and woman, when they copulate and conceive a child, they create the soul of that child through the biological act. In other words, your kid doesn't just get the genetic information that you'd think that you'd associate with biology. He also gets a soul from you, the two parents. That's one view. The other view is called creationism, which has nothing to do with creationism as far as Genesis goes. But that's the idea that, no, the mom and dad just create the body, the material substance of the child, and God creates the soul. In other words, after God looks down and sees, yep, we got a conception over here on aisle five, we need a soul to go in there. <laughs> so God does that, sort of literally like pops it in there. That's view number two. View number three was sort of a rare view in uh, historical theology held by Origen, who's one of my favorite apostolic fathers or patristic fathers because he has all sorts of weird ideas. He's just entertaining. Origen thought that God, before creation, created a specific limited number, a finite number of souls ahead of time, kind of like a soul bank, so that when human, humans conceived, then God didn't have to create them then. He would just like match them up. Okay, you go over there. You know, that's not your body. Your body's over here. And he just literally distributes. God is the great soul distributor. That means that Origen believed in the pre-existence of the soul, which some people try to equate with reincarnation and, and say that early Christianity taught reincarnation. It's not reincarnation. We don't have transmigration of souls. We have pre-existence of souls in Origen's view. So please do not dis Origen by saying that he believed in reincarnation. Humans, what we do know from the text, are animated by the breath of God. Okay, at least Adam was. And he's referred to as a living soul, the nefesh chaya. Chaya there, uh, that Hebrew term refers to the living part. It's really a living organism, a living animal that has a nephesh, that has this thing that gets translated soul. Well, the problem is that animals are also called nephesh chaya, living souls, okay, living nepheshes. Uh, exact same phrase used here in Genesis 1, 20 and 21 and a bunch of other places. God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, Hey, let the birds fly above the earth, so on and so forth. Every living creature, again, nefesh chaya, used down a little bit way, about halfway. So if we're going to define, if we're going to take this language when it's used of humans and say, aha, what's unique about the human is he has a nefesh, they have a soul. No, that doesn't work either because animals do too. Same phrase. It's kind of a dead end. Equal among humans, unique to humans. Again, what about the soul? Um, what, what if it's going back to that you know, intelligence issue or some of the other faculties of the brain? What about emotions? Maybe the, the possession of you know, volitional will. Maybe that's the image. All these things, again, that we associate with our minds, with our brains. If we sort of go down that rabbit trail, we have a problem, too, because nefesh, 
the word soul, and ruach, the word for spirit, are both used, to summarize in the slide, they are both used for the faculties of the mind, the will, and the emotions. They're interchangeable. So you don't get much help there because you can't really distinguish between a nefesh and a ruach, and animals have a nefesh. And, you know, you get some that, you know, will we'll tread over into the, into the ruach territory too. So what are we supposed to do? I would say if there is not clarity in scripture on the nefesh or the ruach being what makes humankind unique, we probably don't want to bank all of our ethics on it. Okay, we probably don't want to stake our ethical positions, our sanctity of life positions, on things that aren't even clear in the text. We certainly don't want to stake them, stake them on things that are shared, either potentially or in real life, with other life forms that are not human. We don't want to link imaging, again, this thing we call the image, to an ability that depends on an organ that has to develop chronologically. Because as soon as you do that, you're, you, you really have to, to be consistent, you have to abandon uh, opposition to things like abortion up to a certain point. You have nothing to go on. You just don't. And anybody who, who knows the biblical text well enough, and believe me, there are people out there who are very pro-choice, who do know the text and are making these arguments, you need something better. And I'm going to give you a, a fairly simple suggestion, but it wouldn't be one that would occur necessarily to the naked eye. What I think the image is, it's not a thing put in humanity. It's not an attribute given to humanity. Think of it as a verb. It's a status. Part of the debate over what the image of God is concerns, again, this phrase, let us make man in our image after our likenesses. Now, as in English, we're dealing with a preposition here, prepositions in Hebrew are used to denote different ideas. I'm going to suggest to you that the key to this, believe it or not, is how you take the preposition in. And this is an actual point of Hebrew grammar that I'm going to show you, so I'm not making it up. But I think that's the key. Let's talk about how we do this in English. If I say, put the dishes in the sink, what am I denoting? What's the meaning? Locality. Location. Put the dishes in the sink. The preposition there tells me location. If I say that something is written in pencil, what do I mean? Same preposition. It certainly isn't location. Source or instrumentality. I didn't adjust my fonts here, my pitch size. See, there you go. He broke the vase in pieces. Denotes what? Result. Here's what to say in reply. Denotes purpose or process. I work in accounting. Means what? If I say I work in accounting, what am I saying? Yes, it could. It could be the location, and the second one is the more important alternative, the type of work. Basically, I would, if I said I worked in education or I work in medicine, it's function or capacity. 
That's my job. That's what I do. It's a verb. Okay. Here's my point. I think we should understand Genesis 1, 26, and 27 as referring, as meaning, that humankind was created to function in the capacity of God. Let us make humankind as our image. All of this points to, a, to viewing the image in a functional sense. We are to created to image God, to be him as though he were here. Okay, we are his representatives. It's a status given to us. It's a function that we need to fulfill. I think if we take that tack, we go to the New Testament, we get some interesting results, or at least we get some interesting cross-fertilization of ideas. Paul says, We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. As we image God, we become more like him. We are transformed into, from what we are into what we should be, what his intention is. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Elsewhere, we have this idea of Christ as the, quote, express image. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's the best imager that there ever was. He is the imager par excellence. He is the template for our own imaging. He is what we ought to be, an imager of God. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, to be more like him, conformed to be like him, to become him, not in an ontological sense, but in a, in a functional, in a works sense, in a, in a sanctification sense. Be conformed to the image of his Son, I'm going to stop there and talk. I just want to say a few more things about this. I think the advantage to this particular uh, view, if I can summarize it, is every person, whether through the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, again, it gets into theodicy, why is there evil? But every human being is born an imager of God. He is born, she is born with that status. It can never be taken away. It is not bestowed incrementally. It is not obtained in stages. It just is. Okay, if you are human, you are an imager of God. You are God's representative on this planet and nothing else is. This is his domain. It's our domain because he gave it to us to be shepherd kings over it. We are him as though he were physically here. Now, in a, in a, in a fallen world, again, under the sovereignty of God, some human beings will never get to do that. They will never get to live out their own role as imagers of God. Okay, they could die prematurely in the womb, they could be aborted, they could be born severely retarded, they will not be able to use the faculties that God uh, has given uh, in principle to humanity, the way that we are biologically made by him. Some human beings never get to do that. But that doesn't diminish the fact that they are and were imagers, period. So whatever happens to be conceived at the moment of conception in the womb, it can only be human, genetically. If it's multiplying cells, it's alive. 
scientifically and theologically, it is an imager. It just is. It doesn't have to develop to the point of being an imager of God. It just is. And I think we, we are on more of a solid foundation uh, with our ethics if we take that view as opposed to any other view that links it to an organ or chronology. Now, are we all are we able to... Sometimes I run through that and I leave people about halfway through. <laughs> so any questions? I have one over here first. Uh, that view also that uh, the image of God is complete and doesn't develop in stages or it's never incomplete mm -hmm. would also speak well to the issue of it's not uh, ever ethical to abort uh, a fetus, a baby. That's the result of rape. No, I, 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 I would agree. Let me, let me give you my, let me give you my little... I can't call it a pilgrimage because I, I didn't go that far. But after I got married and my wife got pregnant for the first time, we had a discussion. <laughs> it was actually more like an argument <laughs> where I said, look, I just want you to know. You know, and she disagreed. I said, I just want you to know, if you go in there to deliver and something goes wrong, I'm going to tell the doctor to pick you over the baby. And she, she didn't like that. I said, look, the fact of the matter is you're going to be lying in that bed and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> I mean, I, I meant it to be a little funny, but she didn't really take it that way. <clears throat> After we had our first kid, I went back to my wife and I said, you know, I've sort of rethought this. <laughs> I said, if there was a problem now, <laughs> you know, because it, it, you know, it, it, it has a dramatic effect on you. So I said, if, if we had a problem now, and the doctor said, what should I do? I would say, do the best you can. You know, she was, she was happier with that. I, I felt some angst over it. But, you know, I also felt like, you know, it's just, it, it's a position that you, you more or less have to take. You know, the, the, and I taught ethics. I've taught ethics for years, and I know all the argument. Well, if you've got three kids and you've got one over here, I mean, how fair is it to leave the three kids without a mother? It's, look, just do the best you can. I know you're not God, Dr. So-and-so. I'm not going to treat you like you are. Oh, here she comes. Perfect timing. I'm, I'm talking about our... I'm talking about our disagreement with the, uh, the first kid when I said if there's a problem, I'm going to save you instead of the, the kid, and you didn't agree with that. So I, I recanted later on. Um, Did that lead to you know. a lot of uh, joy and happiness? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if, if, I, I, th I think, you know, it's... You, this thing about choosing who lives and who dies. You know, if, if you've never, you know, if you've never gone through the process of having a kid, you, you, it's hard to view your, you know, your, your child and your wife on the same plane. You know, if you've never, having never gone through that process, so you're, you're stilted in one direction. You know, and you think, well, my wife will like that because I, I'm putting her above the baby. No, she didn't really go for that. You know? <laughs> Because she has, obviously, I'm not, not trying to make a bad pun here, but she has more of an attachment, you know, to, to the child because, you know, the whole process. You know, I, did, I didn't understand that, but I do now. Yes. Can you be more specific as to what you're wondering about? Right. What if if the if the soul? It goes back to the three views of where the soul comes from. They all work here. <laughs> if the soul is created biologically, then there would be a soul in the clone, 
because it's created from two. You, you, you still have to have the, the genetic, how do you want to say here? You, you don't have a, a joining of egg and sperm, maybe. It depends on what the process is. Um, in other words, you could have that joining and then take something from that and implant it. And there's all these gradations, what's a true clone and what's not a true clone and all that kind of stuff. If the if the soul if the if the soulishness is transmitted biologically, let's just put it that way, then it stands to reason that another biological process could accomplish the same thing, even though it's a different biological process. You know, that's a guess because we don't know where the soul comes from. If God inserts the soul, then it's like, well, it's up to God. You know, um, if we have origins view, then it's also up to God as the distributor. There, there's no scriptural justification for any of these views, by the way. They're guesses. All three of them are guesses. Um, so I, I, I'm predisposed to think that the result of, a, of, of cloning would be, in every other way, completely human. And if we look... Again, this is, a, this is a poor answer because scripture is limited by its pre-scientific language. But to an Old Testament person, people who are using these terms like imaging and nephesh and all this stuff, to them and to the New Testament uh, person, a person was the union of the material and the immaterial. And that is still what you have now. Granted, they're not making the sort of distinctions that we might want to make about what constitutes an immaterial part of a person. But if you took a clone and you introduced it to Abraham and they could walk and talk and function and laugh and cry and think, and you asked him, well, is, is this a person? He'd say, oh, sure, it's a person. You, you know what I mean? It's, it's, an, it's an inadequate answer just because of the context that, that you have. But, you know, we're, we're just not told. But my, my predisposition is to think that that's a human being. I don't think we should, we should clone full human beings and then harvest them as though they were not. And as soon as I make that leap, I have to embrace the idea that they are imagers as well. Otherwise, I have no basis to oppose it. Yes. And done, then the mother will die, too. The will die. Yeah. Right. So I have an ethical dilemma that I can't fully answer. Yes, I would say the mother's life. But in the process, you're directly causing mm -hmm. that conceived child to die. I, I would answer that this way. I actually had a surgeon ask me that question. Mm -hmm. And he was a Seventh-day Adventist, very strong pro-life, and he said, this week, he, he had performed uh, one of these where he removed the, the tiny embryo from the fallopian tube to save the mother's life. And he said, <clears throat> they're, they're there at the table, and, and the nursing staff knows him. They know his position and all this stuff. And he, he held up the little embryo, and you could see the feet. And he hands it to the nurse and says, we just performed an abortion. And so a few days later, he, we read a Bible study. He asked me, you know, what do you, th what do you think of that? You know, exactly the same question that you articulated. And my position is that when you're, when you're in a situation where you, your choice is two deaths or one, you pick one. And he said, that's the way I feel too. But interestingly enough, the Pope disagrees. 
There is no option. His, his, his alternative is just don't do anything and you let them both die. Because you, you cannot take an innocent life in any circumstance. Now, that was, that was John Paul. I don't know what the latest pope's position is or the position of the Catholic Church. He didn't really care. He just thought he'd throw that into the conversation. But I, I, I think the, the most pro-life thing to do when you have my choice is either two people die or one. There's no in-between. You save one life. And in that, that scenario, the only one you can save is the mother. So that, that's how I would approach it. But, you know, if, if the Pope were here and he threw something at me, well, then, you know. That kind of abortion must be point oh oh one. Oh, I, I'm, he, he said, he said it, it's exceedingly rare. Yeah. Exceedingly rare. But ne nevertheless, he, he had one. Yeah. Oh, it is, because you're never going to feel completely... Um, you're never going to feel like, you know, you're never going to get the complete sense that you did the right thing. But I, I, I think I, if it was me, I think I would, I would be able to sort of, I hate to say it this way, but give myself the benefit of the doubt and understand. I mean, God doesn't expect me to be God either. So, you know, what's God going to say to me? Well, why don't you just do something omnipotent? Well, like, because I can't, you know. It was, in, it was in the power of your hand to save a life. And so that's what you do. Yeah. I wanted to leave time for questions tonight, too. If you have anything that you want to just throw out there, feel free. Uh, we, we should say something about the plurals since I brought it up. If we go back to, uh, let's just go here. Here. It's very common to view the plurality language here as the Trinity. Now, my problem with that, other than the fact that we aren't given a number here, we aren't told that there's three, is that there are other passages that speak of divine plurality where you have plural gods okay, in, in the heavens. And you get into some theological problems if you want to link that language to the Trinity. Now, I know I had a browser here open somewhere. Well, I just really don't like seven here for this. Oh. Well, let me go to Explorer. I'll show you what I mean because we don't have the, our software. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, let's look up Psalm 82. And I don't really know how to make that bigger. Somebody told me how to do that last time without a mouse. You hold something down and hit the plus. Control plus, okay. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> I must have done something wrong. I got a little bigger. This verse here, this is a key passage for me in this plurality um, question. It says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. The word God there is the word Elohim. Very common name for God. It's used well over 2,000 times in the Old Testament. The word gods is also Elohim. Okay, in the same verse. Two occurrences, same verse. The first one has to be singular because the verb in Hebrew has taken his place or taken his stand is grammatically singular. That tells you through subject verb agreement, Elohim is singular. So we have one God standing in this council in the midst of the Elohim. There's a preposition there in Hebrew. It's bekerev, which means in the midst of. And you can't be in the midst of one, or you, he's not standing in the midst of himself. He's standing in the midst of gods. And we find out later, here's the problem. If you read the whole passage, 
He's talking about the gods, and they're not behaving very well. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High. All of you, nevertheless, like men, you will die and fall like any prince. This is a, a, a passage where the God of Israel judges the other Elohim. There are other divine plurality passages in the Old Testament that refer to gods in council. Psalm 89. Might as well go there. What I'm going to here is that if you're going to take the plurality language as the Trinity, you can't do that in Psalm 82 because then you have God telling the other members of the Trinity that you're corrupt and you're going to die. That's just bad theology. You, you just don't want to go there. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones, that we have an assembly. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord, who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? Let's see what the little note here is. Hebrew, sons of God. It's B'nai Elim in Hebrew. So, again, you have passages like this where, again, part of the reasoning is polemic. Part of the reasoning is that this is God and his heavenly host. And it's easy to take that and go back to Genesis 1 and say, what we have here in fancy grammatical terms is a plural of exhortation. God says to his counsel, hey, let's make Adam humankind in our image. They say, it's a good idea. So who creates humanity in Genesis 1? If you go back to Genesis 1. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him. The verbs for creation are all singular. Only the God of Israel creates humankind. The rest of the council members, they, they're just entertained. They're just thrilled. If you get to Genesis 3, you have the same language. I think it's around, well, one of them is in 22. Let's just go over to 7. Oh, let's go up a little bit. Okay. For God knows, Elohim knows, that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. If you go down to verse 22... And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. The knowing there is actually a plural participle. Okay. So again, you have plurality language where you have this knowing good and evil talk, and that might make some people uncomfortable in a Trinitarian context. You could get around it. But I think the real issue is taking divine plurality language from Genesis 1 elsewhere gets you into trouble. But if you do it the other way, you don't really have a problem. The only real problem is, what do you mean they're gods in the Old Testament? That they're real. Because God judges them. He's not judging Mickey Mouse, okay, who, who isn't real. Okay? God is consistently compared to the other gods. Um, it, it's just, Old Testament's full of this language. To some people, that sounds like you can't have monotheism there. I don't want to get too far afield. The issue is what's an Elohim? Do you realize there are five things in the Hebrew Bible called Elohim? It's good for trivia. God, the God of Israel. God's plural, like in Psalm 82. Demons in Deuteronomy 32 are called Elohim, the Shadim. Angels, depending on how you take Genesis 32 and what event that refers back to. And lastly, 1 Samuel 28, the spirit of human dead, Samuel. You know the witch of Endor story? Okay, the witch, the medium is better. The mistress of the ove in Hebrew. The departed spirits looks and says, whoa, I see Elohim coming up out of the earth. That's what the Hebrew text says. And Saul says, what does he look like? She describes him and he goes, oh, that's Samuel. Then they have their little conversation and Samuel kicks his butt again from the grave. I mean, it just, you know, you know it's Samuel because of what follows. But Samuel is called an Elohim. He's dead. 
we're used, to, we're used to thinking of the term Elohim and connecting it to a set of attributes, omnipotence, omniscience, what are some other omni words, omnipresence, all that kind of stuff. Because in English, when we say God, that's what we mean, especially for Christians. Elohim doesn't actually mean that. Okay, because you've got five different things that are called Elohim. They can't be all omniscient, omnipotent. They're obviously, the spirit of, of a human dead person is not at the same level as the God of Israel. Okay, it's pretty obvious. Elohim is actually a, what I call a place of residence term. That is, you are called Elohim if your proper domain is the non-embodied world what we call the spiritual world. If by nature you are not embodied, you are an Elohim. Angels, demons, gods, God of Israel, spirit of human dead because we don't have a body now. Okay, we're on the other side. Some in that realm can come over to this realm and become embodied. You know, we know the Old Testament stories about that, God included. And some from our side can go to the other side and see what goes on there. The prophets are classic examples. Elohim means you live over there, not here. You're from over there, not here. Over there, there's rank and power and a certain set of attributes. There's hierarchy. So Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim are Yahweh. That's what an Israelite believed. But, you know, we're, we're modern 20th century Americans, 21st century Americans, and we, our native language is English. And so when we see Psalm 82 translated like the Hebrew text says, it kind of freaks us out because, whoa, you know, how, do we, how do we deal with that? Monotheism is actually a 17th century term. It wasn't used before that as far as English lit scholars tell us. Um, you know, if you want to use it, fine. We know what we're talking about. The God of Israel is unique. That's the point. There is only one uncreated being. There is only one being with that, that set of attributes, and it's him. That's the theological point that has to be made and maintained. You want to stick a label on it, go ahead. You know, whatever label makes you happy. But, you know, the, whole, the point here is divine plurality language identified with the Trinity in the Old Testament will get you into some problems. So I do not take that position. I don't, I'll, I'll take my set of problems over, the, over that set of problems. <laughs> Oh, I, th I, think, I think it's easy to show a Godhead in the Old Testament. You just have to know what you're looking for. Okay, the first class that we did, the first four-week thing, I spent two weeks on that, going through the Old Testament, the way the Old Testament expresses the Godhead idea. It's a, it's, it's a little harder uh, for Trinitarian. There's one passage that sort of, in, in my mind, really looks Trinitarian to me. Um, I'm not going to get into it, but... I'm sure there are others. I, I just need to invest the time uh, looking for it. But as in the Old Testament, you have the God who is, who is spirit. Uh, we call him the Father, God the Father. And then so humans could parse God, and for their own protection, God has, there's a second Yahweh in the Old Testament, and that one is embodied or comes in some other physicalized manifest form. And I'm not a modalist either, if any of you are theologians here. Um, but you have two. So the second Yahweh is but isn't the Father. Jesus is God, but he's not the Father. He is but isn't God. It just depends on, on the language that you use. He's not the Father, he's the Son, but he's still God. Okay? You know, we're used to saying this. It's very you know, creedal in the history of Christianity. That's actually what you have with the Spirit. The Spirit is but isn't Jesus. Do a search in the New Testament sometime for phrases like the Spirit of Christ, or where Spirit is interchanged with Jesus. It's really interesting. There are three. 
and they're one, and sometimes they're two. You know, I mean, you, you, it, it's like playing mind games. You know, it, it, it's, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this. In the Old Testament, you got two running around. Sometimes they're in the same scene, and they're the same, but they're not. And it's the same thing post-resurrection. And some would even say pre-resurrection, where you have Jesus and the Spirit, that the Spirit is but isn't Jesus. He is Jesus, but he's not. Same essence, but the, you know, it's the same issue. And then when you put them all together, you got three. So I think it's, it's very, it, it doesn't take too much work to get there um, and have it really be rooted in the text. But that is a separate issue, because if you have three in one essence, they are the one that bear the unique set of attributes in the spiritual world. There are still other Elohim that are lesser than the Godhead. Okay, I think that's not a Christian invention. I think the Old Testament is there too. Uh, that, that, that's not something that came along and the New Testament writers just, oh, you know, this sounds good, let's make this up. You know, I think it's consistent all the way through. But I don't see it in Genesis 1.26. Any other off-the-wall sorts of questions? <laughs> this is actually an early week, yes. I'm like, We're walking around a little bit with this idea of, of you know, in our image. If you look at a commandment like, you shall not keep my name in vain, and you look at that as ambassadorship, in other words, you shall not identify Mm -hmm. I think it does. Like the New Testament, let those who name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I mean, that's pretty clear. You know, it, it's it's yeah. It, it's not an right. It's not an equation. Okay, now if that fits, and it's a question of ambassadorship, you were kind of implying that being a human. Right. We we are we are like the creator in terms of we're we're the we're the only thing in the in the created realm that is like him in terms of being a reflection. We we have communicable attributes of his that you know it enables us to be him in his absence. And we have, we have those things. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not denying omnipresence, but just, in other words, God creates the earth and says, hey, I want you guys to run it. Uh, I think there's obviously more to it than that. But, you know, we are, you know, let's throw out some terms, you know, understudies. We are, again, shepherd kings. We are ambassadors. We're representatives. We're all these things. Um, by virtue of the fact that we're, we're human. Now, it's interesting, after the fall, that isn't lost because of Genesis 5.1. It's still, the language is still there. And it becomes an issue in Genesis 9.6. So it's not like the image either ends or starts with the fall. It's pre-fall and it continues on. And it's something that is shared by, by humanity broadly um, and exclusively. I don't. I don't think that's. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think. I think you are capable of imaging God, because you're human. Because you're human. If you are allowed to live, and the the things given to you by the Creator, again, biology, you know, he, he created us to reproduce, re reproduce our own kind. Uh, those things are intact. They. They are. They are stilted, okay, they're, they're truncated, okay, in some way. We, we could surely image God better if we weren't fallen, but because we have, we have statements about the image after the fall that don't denigrate the status, they don't make it lesser than what it was, then to me it stands to reason that 
we are still considered imagers. We certainly are because, you know, in light of Genesis 9, 6, we're still God's effigy, so to speak. Okay. So things that we might consider are higher nature, beautiful I, music and... I think, I think all, all of those things, anything that, that, that is part of what we are is intended by God to be used for his glory. And part of that is, let, let's say you're a scientist. Part of your mission is to think God's thoughts after him, to find out what, the, what makes the universe tick. Okay, there's discovery there, and you're using that you know, to glorify God and to better the lives of other imagers. I mean, business. I mean, anything really, you can put almost any area in here. We're getting, we're getting into the really verse 27, the whole idea of the dominion mandate, okay, what, what humanity is tasked to do. Uh, you know, subdue the earth. Uh, it's it's really a yes. It's control, but it's not rape and pillage the earth. Okay. Right. You are a steward and a king, all rolled up into one. Um, and it, it's your job to maintain what God has made, and to use His the, the communicable attribute of God in terms of creatorship. We have creative power. We have creative ability. Not to say exist and it exists. But we can build things. We can make things. We can imagine things. You know, right? You, there, there are things that that humanity does that God, of course, could do and would do a whole lot better. But God says, "Run to it. Take care of it. Go find out how wonderful it is." You know, it's it's all it's all part of of stewarding. You know what what He's done in all, in all these areas. I, you know, if, I don't know how many of you come from a Reformed Christian context, but in the Reformed circles, this is called the, the cultural mandate or the idea that there's no division between secular and sacred. Okay, there is no distinction there. There's no distinct Being in the ministry uh, is, no, is not superior to being anything else because they're all just imaging tasks. God views them all equally. They're equally important. They're equally worthwhile. It's the work ethic, what we call the Protestant work ethic. It has, work has value. It has intrinsic value. And it's all, it's all predicated on Genesis 1, 26 and 27, when theologians talk about it anyway. Yes, sir. Another question that comes to mind, uh, if this being in the image of God, Right. They were they were still human. They are not subhuman. They are heinous and evil, but they are still human. You know that that really gets into the into the whole issue of the effects of sin and you know patternings in life and all that sort of thing um, that James talks about. But it, it it doesn't it doesn't remove their humanity from them in, in terms of. I realize we have that expression, you know, they've lost their humanity, but, you know, we know what we're talking about with, with that. Anybody else? Yes.
is 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 there a hint? Are you asking is there a hint of evangelism here? In in, in the in the latter. Yeah, I, I think, again, if, if we believe there's a God, if we believe that, that God can actually do anything, like communicate, uh, if we believe there's a God, then he can exist in more than one person. He can actually, you know, do something like the incarnation, you know, resurrection, all that stuff. They're all very simple presuppositions that, that follow and extend one from the other. I certainly think that it's not too much of a leap, okay, to say that, we have this culture that God chose. God just, just, I mean, to us it looks arbitrary. And, it, and to our understanding, it may be completely arbitrary. And in God's understanding, it might have been arbitrary. I mean, who knows? But God selects Abraham and says, you know, okay, we're going to start over here, essentially, and create a family uh, for myself, a people, a nation. And God comes to them, gives them revelation, and it's through that person's descendants that God keeps doling out, in a good sense, information. And that is the correct version of events. Okay? This is, because it comes from the mouth of God. I mean, you, I think these are, these are very simple but profound uh, theological statements that are certainly warranted in, in the text. I, I mean, I believe that, that what we have in the Bible is the correct version of events. Okay? I think it mirrors the ancient Near Eastern pagan cultures because that's their culture. Yeah, God, I think, could use the polemic, the strategy there, um, you know, to... I think there is a, a, a sort of... There's an evangelistic bent to that that could... You know, could take hold in somebody's mind. I mean, we don't necessarily know. We have hints of it in the Old Testament. Uh, but I, I certainly don't think that it's it's just like a slavish borrowing because they couldn't think of their own thoughts. And, you know, boy, we got to come up with something here so that it looks like this guy's stuff over here and, you know, all of that. This is why I said a, a week, and even a week before, inspiration really ought to be viewed as a process, and God is in the process. People are... Every, every writer of scripture, God providentially set those guys up to be what they were at the moment that they were supposed to be and act and write and do what they did. And you know, God is in every, every moment you know, of their lives. I, I, I per, one of the other reasons I don't like the traditional view of inspiration is that God zaps people and then he leaves. I guess that's over. You know, again, treating it as a paranormal artifact. If, if, if God is in the process, and it's a slow process, it involves lots of hands, it involves the unpredictability of human behavior, and God has to, you know, step into history again and, and you know, keep working with humanity, that is moment by moment providential oversight. God never takes a day off, okay, when it comes to producing this thing we call the Bible. To me, that, that is, a, is a much higher view of God's activity. And it's not unique to me, okay? So I'm not claiming anything for, my, for myself there, but I, I think that that, you get to appreciate God's activity, his moment by moment activity a little bit more. And if he's interested in humanity and his interest in humanity is shown through this one group and it's that group that produced this book that we call the Bible, then I think that says something. I don't know if that answered your question. But <laughs> Brad. Yeah. We agree that God communicated true revelation about himself to the ancient Israelites. Isn't it just really weird that the true religion happens to be closest to ancient Canaanite religion when the middle religions developed? Why was it more like Polynesian or Japanese or ancient religious mm -hmm. American or I mean, any of the religions it could have been like? It just happened to be closest to. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a direct result of God's choice to act when and where he did and how. Um, you know, when, when, when God acts in time, there are consequences, <laughs> you know, in time. So, if, if, yeah. 
if if the people you're communicating right let's say get let's say we didn't have a bible and god comes to bellingham and picks you know one of you to to start the ball rolling okay god knows i'm going to produce this thing called the bible i'm going to start with this guy over here or this girl over there and he does that and as that person writes down what they you know feel led you know to write because you know, it, it's punctuated with these divine encounters and other things that sort of affirm to the person that, yeah, you know, I, I have a responsibility here. You know, God appeared to me and told me to do this or that. And I haven't seen him in 20 years, but boy, that was pretty memorable. So I ought to, you know, kind of stay with it here. You know, if you have the, the experiences like the patriarchs did and you're going along in your life and you're trying to do the, the best you can with what you think is your mission now, as you recall the, the deity giving it to you, you run into problems, you run into people, you run into issues that by their very nature are going to, by and large, be a byproduct of where you live, who you live with, who you live next to. And so that group is going to go their own way because they don't have you know, what I have. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write in such a way to communicate to my group and to them so that everybody can understand what I'm doing here. And then 500 years later, it looks like you got this from the people in the next neighborhood. Well, that isn't what happened at all. Okay, it, it's, there, there's, a, there's a residual sort of byproduct uh, effect because of the time and place in which you were, in which you were doing that. And that's no surprise to God, because he made the initial decision to start the ball rolling there. And I think a lot of times scholars make mountains out of molehills when they, they get to stuff like this, because frankly, there is a, a I don't want to launch into a boring discussion of the history of biblical criticism, but there is a predisposition in the history of biblical criticism to, let me just say it this way, it's not a coincidence that a lot of this stuff started in the late 19th century and the people involved in it were anti-Semitic. That is not a coincidence. It doesn't mean they're all evil. It just means that they had a certain predisposition to dislike one set of ideas and to favor something else. And some of them made it their mission to bolster the something else and attack the other thing. And we, in biblical studies, have inherited that. That is their legacy to us. It's, it's quite colored by a tradition of anti-Semitism in many cases. Scholarship is not about who's smart and who's dumb. Everybody's smart, okay, who does this. It's about presuppositions. It's always about presuppositions. You know, things that you bring to the table uh, when you begin to do your objective research. <laughs> yeah, that's always what it's about. Anybody else? You know, I, I once said that in a graduate school seminar. I, I wasn't, th there were days I wasn't real popular. There was, there was that day about the anti-Semitism. I had a Jewish professor, and I said, you know, it sure looks to me like a lot of these guys were anti-Semitic. Do you think that might have tainted their objectivity? And he looked at me and he said, yeah, you're probably right, but who cares? <laughs>